It was an engineer that served with distinction not in a time of war, but in a time of exploration, but was deemed to be worth a battalion of Australians in her hour of need, and a natural leader who would sadly die just 14 days into Australia's first major involvement in the First World War. Welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, an Australian military history podcast. This is the life, service, and legacy of Captain Edward Frederick Robert Bage, who before his service in the First World War, served as part of the Australasian Antarctic Expedition. Edward Frederick Robert Bage was born in St Kilda, Victoria on the 17th of April, 1888. Otherwise known as Bob Baggett, he is the only son of Edward Bage, a merchant, and Mary Charlotte Langer. He would have two sisters, Freda and Ethel. He received his education at the Melbourne Church of Grammar School in 1900, and he was awarded the Weatherby Scholarship in 1901. Completing schooling in 1904 with honours in physics at matriculation, in 1905 he was awarded a Warden Scholarship to Trinity College at the University of Melbourne, where he studied engineering. He obtained first-class honours in chemistry and won an exhibition in surveying in 1905, graduating with a Bachelor of Civil Engineering in 1910. While a student, he was a constant fixture of the college social scene and while also being the inaugural secretary of the University of Melbourne Student Representative Council and rode for the College 8 at Tr- for Trinity College. Bage joined the militia in 1909 and enlisted as an officer of the rank of second lieutenant with the Royal Australian Engineers, initially posted to Queensland for two years before being promoted to full lieutenant at the start of 1911 and spent time assigned to the submarine mining station in Sydney, one part of the fixed defences of the port city, namely responsible for the maintenance, deployment and detonation of sea mines before taking up the same post in Melbourne where he would be the station commander. In September, however, he requested leave from the permanent military force to be engaged as an astronomer, assistant magnetician and recorder of tides for Douglas Mawson's Australasian Antarctic Expedition. He undertook a crash course in astronomy with Pietro Baracci from the Melbourne Observatory whose son Guido Beige knew from his time at Trinity College. On the 22nd of November, a farewell dinner was held for his honour in Trinity College, after which he left for Tasmania to join the expedition. The Australasian Antarctic Expedition was a three-year survey mission headed by Sir Douglas Mawson, who most Australians who comprise my list of demographic would recognise as one of the faces on the old $100 paper bill from 1984 to 1986. The intent of this operation was to explore the largely untarded Antarctic coast immediately to the south of Australia, covering some 4,180 kilometres or 2,600 miles of unexplored ice shelves, mountains and crevasses, while its support ship, the AY Aurora, would chart 2,900 kilometres or 1,800 miles of coastline. While there, the expedition would also conduct scientific experiments including meteorological ex- measurements, magnetic observations, an expansive oceanographic program, and the collection of many biological and geological samples, including the discovery of the first meteorite found in Antarctica. Mawson selected Beige in a party of six to accompany him on the 9th of January, landing at what he then called Commonwealth Bay, and then on the 19th of January, the Aurora left 18 men with 23 tons of equipment and two years' worth of food to conduct the surveying expedition. The plan called for four separate parties who would then travel out from base camp with specific objectives. Bage was assigned to command the southern party comprised of himself, the New Zealand magnetician Eric Webb, and photographer Frank Hurley, a man who would go on to immense fame as one of Australia's official wartime photographers for both the First and Second World Wars. He would lead his party south on a 600-mile round trip to study the extent of the South Magnetic Pole region. There would also be expeditions along the coast on mapping missions or two specific previously observed landmarks. While there was no set objectives aside from this, all the parties had to return to base camp by the 15th of January 1913 for the Aurora to be expected to come retrieve them. Despite days in which, due to severe snow blindness, Beige had to be carried on one of the sleds hauled by the other men, the team managed to set a sledding record of 41.6 miles in one 24-hour period. One of the men who had remained at the base camp, Charles Lasterson, recorded that Beige's quiet determination, resolution, and foresight carried them through. Always cheerful, ready with a hand for anybody who needed it, he was a born leader of men. When the Aurora returned to collect them, all bar one party had returned, the one led by expedition leader Douglas Mawson, who had been tasked with reaching Oates Land, roughly 560 kilometres from their base camp. By the 8th of February, as the Aurora and the other teams waited, Mawson's team was still now four weeks overdue, This left John Davis, the officer in charge of the Aurora, 
Aurora to decide if the ship would stay and risk being frozen in, leave a team to conduct a search, or abandon Morse and his team to the elements. The decision had been made that the team would stay behind to conduct a search and the Aurora would return when conditions improved. The six men chosen, including Beige, would have no choice but to weather another Antarctic winter before the ship could come back to collect them. A mere matter of hours after the Aurora left, Mawson appeared alone, suffering from severe sunburn, frostbite, and malnutrition. He was the sole survivor of his team. Beige and the rescue party had been able to signal the Aurora, who was able to return the following day, only to be prevented from reaching the survivors by severe weather. After a week, Davis decided that the Aurora would leave once again. Mawson, Beige, and the others spent another winter in Antarctica, with Beige serving as storeman for the survivors. The Aurora returned on the 13th of December 1913 and collected the, the party. The expedition then returned to Australia, landing in Adelaide, Mawson's hometown, on the 26th of February 1914, after more than two years away to grand fanfare. As a result, Mawson would get knighted for this affair. Considering the expedition was stuck in the Antarctic, Beige had requested an extension to his leave from the army, which was understandably approved. When Beige rejoined his unit on the 3rd of March 1914, he was posted to the staff office in Melbourne. As a member of the regular army at the outbreak of the Great War, Beige was immediately mobilised, with preliminary orders being released on the 2nd of August. He was commissioned as a lieutenant to the Australian Imperial Force and served as second in command of the 3rd Field Company Australian Engineers. Early in September, he became engaged to Dorothy Scantlebury, but at the time was in her third year at university studying to become a teacher. Sadly, the engagement would not result in wedded bliss, as Beige would depart for the war on the 22nd of September aboard the troop ship HMAT A2 Geelong, arriving in Alexandria on the 10th of December. In February 1915, he was promoted to captain and was awarded the Polar Medal, Polar Medal by George V. Training continued with the unit until the 3rd of April, when the 3rd Field Company left for Lemnos on the 24th of April, and departed in readiness for the Gallipoli landings. The engineers were some of the first men to reach the shore, preparing the area so that the infantry could land by building roads, creating gun emplacements, digging trenches, and establishing ammunition depots. On the 7th of May, the commander of the 1st Australian Division, Major General William Throsby Bridges, inspected the area known as the Pimple, a salient to the southern end of the Anzac Lines, and devised a plan to take some of the Turkish trenches in that region. Beige received orders that he was to take a small party in support of Major Edmund Drake Brockman of the 11th Battalion, and in broad daylight, get to an exposed area about 150 yards beyond the front line and peg up positions for a new trench system that the infantry could dig in that night. By all accounts of engineers under his command, Beige did this knowing that he was probably not coming back, and considering his rank at the time, it wasn't even a task that he himself had to undertake, but he knew it had to be done. Beige was caught by a machine gun fire from near Lone Pine and was hit in several places, and according to Sapper, James Campbell went out like a very gallant gentleman, his body wasn't able to be immediately recovered, but he was buried in the beach cemetery above Anzac Cove the following day. Following his death, he was mentioned in division files for acts of conspicuous gallantry and valuable service, which is uncommon for those who had already been killed in action. But a mention in dispatches is one of only two awards that can be awarded posthumously. His obituaries noted that he was very popular among both officers and men, and that he was an indefatigable worker, a thorough and efficient organiser, and one of the most promising of the younger officers of the permanent forces. Trinity College held a memorial service for him on the 19th of June, in which all members of the late soldier's family were present, and at the beginning of 1916, his mother donated £1,000 to the University of Melbourne for an engineering scholarship in her son's memory, to the value of £40 per annum. Dorothy Scantlebury would go on to become the principal of Turak College, and spent a period of time in Kenya as part of the civil service. There, she married a member of the colonial office and would have three children. However, she would become widowed and pass away on the 21st of August, 1974. Beige's story is as one of five men from Trinity College who lost their lives during the Gallipoli campaign. However, because of his pre-war recognition in the Antarctic expedition, it is the best documented. Beige was the kind of soldier who saw service not as a duty, but an obligation. He was an engineer by trade, but decided to use those skills to further mankind through exploration and science, while also knowing his full responsibility in warfare. And for that, we are incredibly grateful for his service. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast, a Doc Network production. 
This episode was written, produced, and audio engineered by me, Ross Manuel, with additional research done by Laurie Favell. I'd really appreciate it, and it would help out the show, if you took some time to share this with a friend, or leave a review on Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or iTunes, or anywhere that you listen to podcasts, as it really helps other people find the show. If you want to know more about today's episode, with photos, show notes, and transcripts, head to www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on IWODMJ on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't worry, there's a link in the show notes. If you want to follow me for history-related hijinks and other nerdery, you can follow me on practically everything at Doc Winters. Once again, thanks for listening, and catch you next time. Bye!